We are back wearing my one ohm plus shirt. That isn't even mine. <laughs> Had to steal it from Kaylee for the day because I want to talk about this diagram that I stumbled across last week, which is from 2004, published by the New York Times, and it is hilarious, but also pretty informative. Compared to today, where publications are sharing memes and anything that'll clickbait you, that way they can sell an advertisement to Tank, Clash Royale, the fourth. It's hilarious. It's so good and it teaches you a lot about the house that I think deserves more interest than just Comme des Garçons Play, Dover Street Market, workwear jackets, and those sorts of things. It was the early 80s that Comme des Garçons started taking on the rest of the world by storm, and one of the reasons being that the fashion industry was on the total opposite end of the spectrum stylistically. It was overly ornate and sexualized fashion, and then when Comme des Garçons, and let's add Yoji into the mix, came to Paris to debut their collections there, although they've been brands for years and years, it was the opposite. It was monochromatic, it was distressed. The clothing hid the figure of the models on the runway, all of which was so radical at the time. And since Comme des Garçons has only maintained their status at the forefront of fashion, mainly due to Rei Kawakubo's dedication to reinvention and starting from scratch every single collection, but a really big point, which will be interesting in this video, taking, taking a look at the entire family tree of Comme des Garçons is the marriage between this idea of the avant-garde and commercial success. There's a brief look at the main pillar of this universe, the actual namesake Comme des Garçons label. Unconventional on so many levels, all about reinvention and increasingly sculptural as it's moved on. But I think a best place to start would be right in the middle of this diagram, which is of course what they wrote is the nucleus, Ure <laughs> Kawakubo. I don't know if this is space themed or atomic structure themed, but Ray is a super, super interesting designer. Her career started studying at Keio University. Whew, my pronunciation's gonna be rough which is a university her father taught at. She then got a job in advertising at a textile company and went freelance later on in the 60s, where, as I love this story and it's fairly common, there isn't any clothes for her in her styling career, so she starts making them, gains little popularity, and eventually starts Comme des Garçons, which was named after Francois Hardy record. There were so many conspiracy theories as to the name, but her partner in life and business, Adrian Joffe, recently confirmed it is a Francois Hardy record, which I love because she's been referenced by a few designers like Veronique Bronchino, and she is one artist that I can play at dinner when we're cooking for my parents, and they'll say, oh, this is nice music. I love this. So look up Francois Hardy. Earlier, I mentioned the first show being in Paris, but the brand started years prior in Japan, and the first runway show was in Tokyo in 75. Then they opened up a boutique in Aoyama, which has only since grown as a neighborhood of luxury goods. And just a few years later, you have Ohm in 1978, but you can see on the diagram, there are so many different lines of Ohm. There are so many different lines on the female end of things too. But that's probably a bad way to describe it because you'll see when we talk about Junia, there are, women's wearing when, there are women wearing men's pieces and men's wearing women's as it should be. Um, if anything, that's what they're missing is that it just isn't completely unisex but it's fairly androgynous and all of that good stuff. So there are a lot of brands here, all of their own distinct style around Ray Kawakubo, 
but I think a good way to describe the relationship of the different designers and the whole hierarchy at Comme des Garçons is to talk about Junia because Comme has pumped out naturally so many geniuses in the fashion industry. Strong word, but definitely the right choice. Being the first to graduate from a Comme des Garçons pattern maker to having his own line is super interesting. And you can probably tell that he must have had the best guidance and the most rigorous work. He is known for his super technical pattern making skills and com combining it, combining it with futuristic textiles. There's glow in the dark stuff, waterproof hidden zippers. Beautiful, beautiful, futuristic, but very wearable clothing. He graduated from Bunka Fashion Institute, which you may be familiar with from a lot of awesome Japanese fashion designers today, and had a very similar timeline to Kawakubo in the fact that he started with women's and then eventually introduced a menswear label two years later. But on this diagram, you can see that there are two separate menswear lines, actually three. And this is a really interesting breakdown. You have the more artisanal label, you have the more down to earth one. And then when women started wearing the down to earth menswear label under Junya Watanabe, they created pink, which is a menswear label, but geared towards women and their taste in the menswear line, which I love, super, super cool. But could it, could it all just be one? Who knows? I'm sure they know better than I do. And with the collaborations, you could add Puma, Carhartt, Converse to this list. So many. And also on this orbit, I isn't on the list, which would introduce even more. Um, I know they did Lee's denim and New Balance. And that's a basic slime, more graphic heavy that you could wear out and about every single day and not worry about it. Underneath Watanabe, you can see another brainchild of the CDG universe, Tao Kodihara. She was actually a mentee of Junya Watanabe up there, and she is at the helm currently, I believe, of Trico, which is knitwear under Comme des Garçons. And this is interesting because you can really see people shifting roles. That was Junya Watanabe's first position of power within Comme des Garçons after graduating from being a pattern maker. So that's really cool. One thing that you do have to amend is that Kurihara does not have her own namesake label anymore. That folded back in 2011 when she really respectfully folded it saying she wanted a change of pace and just to take over. Trico. There are actually two others that didn't make the diagram quite yet. And if you like what I'm about to say about them, or if you're interested in the past, there are so many awesome, young, talented individuals coming out of Comme des Garçons. Check out Sakai, check out Kalor, and I'm sure there are others that I am ignorant of. So fill me down below in the comments, but I'll link some interesting articles down below for you guys to check out. But it's missing Fumito Ganryu, which is a really interesting one because it's not on here, but also it shouldn't be. They had a 10 year run of that label and it was super comfortable, sporty clothing. And it closed its doors a decade after being founded in 2007. Now a label that is completely missing from this diagram is Noir Kai Ninomiya. Wow, I tried my best. And this is a really interesting label, still going because the whole idea, Noir, is to take a completely blank canvas that is black the color black provides a blank canvas where this label can experiment with weight of fabrics, textures, of course the patterning process as well as the production process and create something completely unique out of that black canvas. Since its founding, they have introduced other colors. It's usually very monochromatic, but they do use whites and others. If that sounds like it's up your alley, definitely recommend it. And I also wanna talk a little bit about the family, the Comme des Garçons relationship, because obviously Rei Kawakubo is still at the helm. But what's really interesting is that she doesn't apply any control, and this is total Comme des Garçons fashion. I think it goes hand in hand with core values such as starting from scratch or wanting to use non-luxurious materials. Um, the belief that 
you need complete autonomy in order to create something. So she never really oversees her, her mentee's work until a day before the collection. A really interesting story is that when Rei Kawakubo and Yoji Yamamoto were in a relationship and working to show their collections in Paris, they never shared their, their work. They lived together and never shared their work until right before the shows. And from what I've read, it sounds like a very similar relationship, even though it's under the same company and technically it is a business, but it's just mutual respect. She doesn't overly praise anyone. It is respect for expressing yourself through technical skill and experimentation, which is so cool. And also you can't forget the hundreds of other people on the team, on the business side, and also in the factory willing to work with these outlandish designs and production processes. So thank you to them as well, I guess. Let's take a look at some of this other interesting stuff on the diagram. We skipped some stuff that's definitely worth talking about around Kawakubo and her orbit, I guess. On the right, Om Du is suiting, but it's very comme des garçons suiting. A lot of wrinkled fabrics and shorter pants. Reminds me of the Miyuki tribe, which is a huge role in bringing American clothing to Japan, which is super interesting. Skipping play. The fragrance arm of the Comme des Garçons universe is the epitome of what I was saying earlier, the marriage between avant-garde and commercial success. Maybe it's just a completely separate beast than clothing, but nonetheless, the ingredients and the notes in the perfumes are totally unorthodox. You have things like sand and flaming metal, I think. And they're so, so popular. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. They have crushed it with that. They have crushed it, crushed it with their fragrances. Shirt is, of course, shirts that then went into other garments as well, other items as well. But what's interesting about shirt is that it was introduced in order to capture the European market by introducing these nice French-made classic garments with, of course, the Comme des Garçons twist. Something different about them, something eccentric. As far as these twists go, like for shirt or for the perfumes, retail is one of the most interesting ones. And that's something that I'm fairly familiar with, mainly from school, that I studied entrepreneurship and sustainable business and my classes about retailing or sales the whole idea of the industry moving towards the experience economy and structuring retail stores rather than selling goods but being an experience. And Comme des Garçons inadvertently nailed this years and years prior. An interesting thing about Dover Street Market, if you guys aren't familiar, Dover Street Market is a fairly experimental department store. They carry many brands, but they are owned by Comme des Garçons, where that's a joint company and Rei Kawakubo's spouse oversees all of that sort of stuff. It's been frequently referred to as a museum that you can walk through multiple floors. They're always in sort of weird districts. The sixth one that opened in Los Angeles is in the Arts District, which isn't a very popular area, rather than all of the Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Barneys right next door to each other. One of the really interesting things I read in an interview with Adrian Joffe a while ago was that the first store, I might as well add, was in London, of course, and that's still their main space. And he is on record so blatantly and strongly pushing that London could be the only place that a Dover Street Market would work because of the community, because of the energy, the ideals of the London crowd. It'll only work in London. And here we are years and years later and there are six different Dover Street markets and it's very frequently hailed as the top luxury boutique. I think that's probably the wrong, the wrong way to say it because luxury boutique, you think of like the Gucci's, like I said, but people love, love, love Dover Street and it's for good reason. That's the perfect description of through Comme des Garçons core values of reinvention and just doing what makes sense to them in their heads 
how ahead of the curve they were compared to retailers that are starting to have this more museum-like experience-based retail space. And it wasn't because it was calculated like companies do now, but it's because that's what they loved and that's what they wanted to give their customers, which is lovely. The other stores I really wanna talk with you guys about are the Gorilla stores. I'm not sure if these are still open, but this is such a wonderful idea. I love the stories of designers like giving out their jeans to artists you know, supporting their local scene with clothing and that's how they became popular. Relationship with friends and others that they looked up to. And the Gorilla Stores was a very similar idea headed up by two individuals in different departments of the Comme des Garçons company. And they came together to build stores in outside communities, scenes besides fashion. So I wanna say the Warsaw one was located in some sort of artist compound where a lot of artists lived and work. Individuals that have the same core values as I've been mentioning so, so much, but maybe aren't really interested in fashion and they wanted to give them clothing with the same quality as their work and clothing that they could express themselves and really identify with. I think the issue that, that I mentioned really briefly earlier is that it was probably just too expensive for a lot of artists to afford. So I think it just would have been more worthwhile to build relationship with these artists or give them clothes to work in, something like that. And I know what ended up happening was it was a lot of basics in these gorilla stores, these more hidden down to earth in the corners of uh, smaller cities like Glasgow, let's say. So the clothes they ended up stocking were simpler, more basic, graphic based, and pretty much the opposite of what truly equates to these artists. Hmm, collaborations. Should we talk about H&M Comme des Garçons? Or that may be, <laughs> that just might be too big of a debate for this video. Anyway, that is a brief, brief history of Comme des Garçons and a look into the Comme des Garçons universe. Hopefully I could share a little bit about different lines and the different designers under the umbrella of Comme des Garçons. That way you guys can look more into what you feel you might really relate to. I'll link some stuff down below, articles, interviews, that sort of thing. That way you can learn more if you want to because there is so, so much interesting information about this fashion house that ultimately I think deserves its popularity and deserves maybe more so in its more obscure nooks and crannies of the company. I just said that, that's a sentence. But thank you guys for watching, thank you guys for supporting this channel and all of that. Hit me down in the comments, let me know what I missed, let me know what needs to be amended to this diagram, let me know what I need to be corrected on, shoot me some questions, let's get the chat going. But that's it, until the next video, everyone do me one last favor. Have a good day. I'll see you in the next one. Peace, guys. Take care.